We're going to be in Zechariah 13, 7 through 9, so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. I'm going to read the text, and then I'm going to pray, and we'll get started. The word of the Lord. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who stands next to me, declares the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. I will turn my hand against the little ones. In the whole land, declares the Lord, two-thirds shall be cut off and perish, and one-third shall be left alive. And I will put this third into the fire and refine them as one refined silver and test them as gold is tested. They will call upon my name, and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people, and they will say, the Lord is my God. Father, we thank you this morning that we can call you God. We thank you that we have an identity as your people, but that identity did not come without great sacrifice to your son, your son who tells us that he is the good shepherd as Pastor Bruce read. We thank you that the good shepherd cares for his sheep. He knows his sheep, he loves his sheep, he secures and satisfies his sheep. Pray that you would bless um, my preaching this morning. I pray that your word would go forth in power, that it would uh, convict and comfort, um, that it would transform and try, and that you would produce fruit uh, that only you can produce uh, in the life of the hearer. We love you. Uh, amen. All right. So just a quick question to get us started this morning. And that question is this, what brings you security and satisfaction? What comes to mind when you think of those two words? If you're like most Americans, then I think we would probably say that it is money or uh, achieving, achieving a certain level of financial independence or security. In fact, this actually was corroborated in a recent 2023 survey by Bankrate, uh, where they surveyed a subset of Americans and they found that of this group of individuals that they felt that if they could somehow achieve or reach the point of getting to a six-figure income, they would be satisfied and they would, it would alleviate a lot of the financial hardships that they face. However, interestingly enough, also in the survey, it was found that of Americans who achieved a six-figure income, they were also inclined to feel equally insecure once they finally achieved that goal. So what's going on here? There's some sort of disparity. These two things don't seem like they are congruent with one another. Well, what ended up happening is after these individuals achieved that level of financial success, they started increasing their standard of living. They started purchasing more, pursuing more luxuries, and started outpacing their earning. So why is it that they are, if they're able to achieve the goal that they feel like they needed to achieve to feel secure, they end up feeling more empty and insecure? Well, we as Christians, I think, have an answer to that. It's because these impermanent things can't bring the internal security that we need. You see, if we rely on empty pleasures, temporary pleasures, to bring permanent security and satisfaction, we're going to find ourselves in a never-ending cycle of wanting, getting, and feeling more empty. When today's passage, we're going to be revisiting the imagery of the shepherd that we saw in the prior chapters that we've been in in Zechariah. And what is the role of a shepherd? Well, a, a shepherd is to be a leader of the people. The shepherd is to offer security and protection and care to the sheep. But the shepherds of the Israelites are failing in this capacity. And it is as a result of this failure that the Lord's judgment has followed a progression over the last couple chapters that has increased in its severity. In chapter 10 through 1, we recall that he is angry with these shepherds because of their behavior. 
In 11, one through three, we see the destruction of the environment where it says the cedars of Lebanon are shattered. And here in 13, seven through nine, we see the enactment of God's final judgment. And as he does this for the Israelites, and of course for his own glory, so too he does this for you and I. God will not let us continue to pursue satisfaction and security apart from himself. Because one, he loves us. He knows that those ways are futile and empty. And two, because he is worthy of worship. And the truth is that if we're looking for satisfaction and security apart from Jesus, we will find ourselves for feeling ever more empty because satisfaction and security can only be found in what the good shepherd can offer. So in this morning, we're gonna be looking at three provisions that the good shepherd makes to secure his sheep and ensure their satisfaction is in him. The first provision is this, he strikes. We'll see this in verse seven. He removes all obstructions. Two, he saves, he secures a remnant. And three, he sanctifies. For those he saves, he sanctifies. He refines our hearts. As we get into this text this morning, we're gonna be looking at two audiences here. There is, of course, the original audience that this is addressed to. And we'll unpack the meaning as well as I possibly can to this first audience. That is, this message given by the prophet Zechariah to the Israelites. And then we're also gonna look at this through the lens of the second audience. That's you, I, those who have been found in Christ, those who have made a profession of faith in Jesus, standing on the other side of the cross. So let's jump in here. So verse seven says, Awaken, O sword, against the shepherd, against the man who stands next to me. So in looking at this verse, there are first two questions that we need to have answered here. Uh, first, who is this shepherd? And why is a sword being summoned? Now, most biblical scholars believe that the shepherds here in view would be the leaders that had been set up over the people during this time. And as we mentioned, these leaders are not leading. They're failing in their call. They're not shepherding the flock. And this is actually very much in line if we rewind back to what we saw in Zechariah 11:17. If you recall, in that passage, there is a woe oracle proclaimed against the worthless shepherds who are failing to care for the flock. A woe, we don't use that word often in our 21st century language. I don't hear many of you going around saying woe is, well, maybe some of you say woe is me. I don't know how, how you tend to speak. But it's not a word that we commonly use. Uh, and what it signifies is a great uh, grief and distress and dissatisfaction with something. You know, this is not the only place we see this in Zechariah 13, because we also see Jesus in the New Testament proclaiming seven woes against the scribes and Pharisees due to their hypocrisy. That is, them teaching something that they are not living out in their lives themselves. And he is distraught and rebukes them for this. The other thing we have to look at here with these shepherds as we read this passage, we don't need to make the mistake when it sa says here in seven, against the man who stands next to me, these are not saying that these shepherds are on equal footing with God, right? That would be a heresy. They are not on equal footing, but the Lord has set them up in a position of authority to rule over the people. But we could use that word rule uh, loosely because they are not ruling well. And it is in the context of this that the sword is called to awaken. There's an action required to be taken against the failure of these shepherds. So a sword throughout prophetic uh, literature represents one thing, and that is death and destruction. So this sword consumes the shepherds who in their failure now have their lives taken from them. And why is their life being taken from them? Well, I think we have to look back to verse two uh, to understand a little bit more about what's happening here. You see, these shepherds have allowed idol worship and all other things to creep in that would compete with God receiving the worship that he is due. 
In verse 2, we see if we go back that it says, And on that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will cut off the names of the idols from the land so that they will be remembered no more. So it can be implied here that these people have turned to worshiping idols. And that didn't just happen in a vacuum. This happened underneath the watch of the shepherds. So in this way, these shepherds, by either overtly leading the people to worship idols or passively um, leading or by their example causing the flock to worship idols, have broken the first two commandments, which are don't have any other gods before me. And the Lord, as he told Moses, don't make any idols. So the people are turned to being led by idols, and the Lord will not allow the worship that he is due to be kept from himself. He doesn't sit by as a bystander, but he takes action in destroying the idols and also destroying the shepherd. You see, to secure the sheep, the shepherd must be dealt with, and in dealing with the shepherd, the idols are dealt with. And that is that first provision that we discussed. So he strikes. So there are things that come into our life and they seek to compete with God receiving the worship he deserves. And because he is good, because he is a good God, because he is righteous, because he is just, he will deal with them. A couple of sermons ago, um, uh, Pastor Joe pointed out my love of potato chips, which I felt personally attacked sitting in the audience. I thought it was just going to stay uh, to him, but no, it made its way to me. And uh, it, is, it is true. I do love potato chips. I have not ever met a potato that I didn't like. If you've got any potato product, I'll eat it. Um, and a potato can actually have a lot of health benefits to it. I'm not trying to justify. It sounds like I'm justifying my position here. It does, though. It's got uh, vitamin C. It's got uh, potassium. Um, but when you take a potato the way I like to eat it, and you cut it up, and you throw it into a fryer, it becomes potato chips. And um, that, that, that's not so healthy. Um, so eating a baked potato for dinner is not the same as eating a quarter of a bag of chips when you're watching your favorite programming. And um, that is, I confess to you, something I do. So I'm trying to make better decisions for my health. So you can hold me accountable to that. Um, why do I use that as an illustration? Well, you know, there are certain things in our lives that are okay for us to participate in. They might even be good things. Um, but when we take that too far, uh, those things can become unhealthy for us. And they can, in, in fact, become bad for us, right? So when we look at this passage here and we get this reference to these shepherds failing, and I go back and connect that to verse 2 to idols, uh, we're not looking at this in the sense in our modern age and applying it to you and I and saying that, we are in practice of creating physical graven images. I hope that's not your practice. I hope you're not, you don't have a workshop somewhere and you're making idols. Um, but the reality is that we do often have secret little loves that we put before our worship to the Lord. And the Lord in knowing this and the Lord in loving us takes action to intervene against these things. He takes actions to address the things that keep the worship from him. So what are these things then in our lives that we tend to hold with an unhealthy uh, infatuation that become injurious to us. Well, perhaps it's the job that you've always dreamed of getting. Perhaps you've spent years in school or you've spent years plying a craft uh, and that investment, all those hours that you've put in, you feel like if you could just go through those series of steps, it would move you in the position of being able to get that dream job that would give you that income, that would better provide for your family, it would give you more margin, give you play money, make you more uh, financially or um, make you more secure. The reality is, for some of you here, perhaps that job is now taking you from being a part of your church. Maybe you now are missing more of the regular intervals that we have of discipleship where you are uh, attending your small groups less, where you're less involved in the men's and women's groups, where we seldom see you on a Sunday morning. Perhaps it's caused you also to spend less time with your family. It's keeping you away from the place where you're sp supposed to be and caring for your spouse and caring for your kids. Perhaps now you have replaced a love for the Lord with a love for performance and success. There is a, um, a line from a Christian rap group that I really like. Yep, I like rap, Christian rap. 
uh, called Beautiful Eulogy. And uh, in this song, the song is called If, uh, there's a line that's always stuck with me, and it says this. It says, what is concealed in the heart of having is revealed in the losing of things. What is concealed in the heart of having is revealed in the losing of things. So what I take that to mean is that when something is taken away from us, it truly reveals what we love. When we lose a job, when we lose our health, and we find ourselves in a deep state of bitterness, what does this teach us about our hearts in the first place? Do we treasure the gift or do we treasure the giver of the gift? All right, the second part of the verse. So we see that the shepherd is struck and the sheep are scattered. So scattered can be taken to mean divided. All right, so in other words, the people, as a result of the fall of the shepherd, will be divided. And I don't know if you know much about sheep. I don't know a lot about them, but I do know what I've read in the word here. And I know that they are not the smartest animals, all right? And without direction, sheep will wonder. Let me read you a, a quick snippet from a, a news story uh, that gives a little bit more perspective. This was from actually a, a, a newspaper in Iran. Uh, and it says this, it says, hundreds of sheep followed their leader off a cliff in eastern Turkey, plunging to their deaths this week while shepherds looked on in dismay. 400 sheep fell 15 meters to their death in a ravine in Van province near Iran, but broke the fall of another 1,100 animals who survived. Shepherds from a nearby village neglected the flock while eating breakfast, leaving the sheep to roam free. The loss to local farmers was an estimated $74,000. So in this story, the shepherds are enjoying their breakfast. They're eating their bagels and the cheeses and their olives. And the sheep, while being unwatched, unattended to, have made their way right off the cliff to their destruction. Now, obviously, there's a pastoral warning here as someone who is called to shepherd the flock. And I don't think any of us as pastors would take this call lightly. And in fulfilling that call, that sometimes means that the Lord moves us in the direction of having to address difficult things. Perhaps it's addressing something we see in the congregation that we need to make sure that our, our sheep, our congregants are aware of. Perhaps it's in a difficult accountability that we have to render that we'd prefer to not be doing. But the point is, if we don't fulfill this call, it puts the sheep in danger. But here is also good news in that, that while we even being flawed men, we serve a good shepherd who never fails his sheep. And when we look at this particular part of this passage, we have to understand that the Lord is sovereign in having orchestrated these events. He has removed the bad shepherd but I think when maybe we look at this and saying that the shepherd's removed, how could we say that he's good when the shepherd have no one leading them? But it's the Lord who's actively leading them. If you go back to Ezekiel 34, um, there's a pas this passage here talks about shepherds as well who are failing to care for the sheep. And in verse 11 in Ezekiel 34, it's God who says, in response to this failure on the part of the shepherds, he says that he, he will serve as the shepherd of his sheep. He will step in and care for his sheep. So while man fails, God never fails. He is shepherd in shepherding and caring for his people here. He pours out his judgment against the little ones in verse 7. Now, when I first read this part of the verse, I was a little bit confused um, because this is not in reference to children being recipients of the Lord's wrath 
on the failure, on the part of the failure of the shepherds. Although you definitely could argue that as a result of the failure, there could be collateral damage, and that could be part of that. But this is rather a qualifying of the worth of the shepherds, the leaders of the people. The translation would be insignificant ones, meaning those who have been found worthless, meaning they were not worth considering. And this is God, again, striking out to address the failure on the part of these shepherds. And as a result of that judgment, in verse 8, we see in the whole of the land that two-thirds shall be cut off and perish, and one-third will be left alive. Now, this land would be the entirety of the province of Yehud, and it would be uh, all the areas that would have included the northern and southern kingdoms of Israel. But when I was reading this, I couldn't help but ask the question, why doesn't the action just stop at the destruction of the shepherd? And even more so, what bad news it would be if it just stopped there. But God, even striking out at the shepherd, has a plan to preserve the sheep. He is good to keep his promises. He has said he will preserve his people, and his people are identified through this process of division. There will be one-third that are kept as a remnant. Now, doctrinally, this is what is known as remnant theology. So that the teaching in view here is that God will always be true to preserve his people. He will have a people who always worship him. Now, depending on what lens you view this through, there's a couple things you could arrive at here. Some would say this holds specifically and only to true, or what they would call ethnic Israel. Um, and there are others that hold to the fact that when we speak of anywhere uh, in reference to Israel, the true Israel, we are speaking of those of the family of faith whose hearts have been transformed by the saving work of Christ. Uh, I hold to that second conviction uh, that this remnant here, this true Israel, uh, are not only the ethnic Jews, but also the Gentiles who are grafted into this community of faith. What we could also call, here as we're sitting here this morning, the church. God's remnant are those Jews and Gentiles alike for whom he has brought saving faith. If you want to understand this more uh, and what we mean when we speak of when we talk about the true Israel, the preserved remnant, uh, your homework is to read through Romans 9 through 11. All right, so herein, with this scattering, this dividing, we have our second provision. The bad shepherd is struck, and the Lord is moving in the direction of saving. So he saves so what is the purpose of the dividing? Well, division always creates distinction, right? It reveals one thing from another thing. In this instance, it reveals the true sheep from the goats. And the distinction is deliberate because in the striking and in the scattering, the Lord is preserving his people. And in preserving that remnant, he has a plan for that remnant. See, there's two realities here. There are those that are scattered and saved to everlasting life, and there are those that are scattered to destruction. I think the tendency is to look at the different parts of the Bible, the Old Testament and New Testament, and say, yes, that seems like something the Old Testament God would do, God the Father, but Jesus would never behave this way. Jesus just calls us all to come as we are into his presence. And that is true. Jesus does say, come as you are. But he doesn't let us stay as we are. An experience with Jesus transforms our lives. Jesus in Matthew 3, 12 tells a parable where he uses the imagery of the wheat and tares. The wheat in the story is gathered into the barn where it is kept secure and the tares, which are weeds, are ultimately burned. So what is he speaking of here? Well, he's speaking of true believers, the remnant, in contrast to those who reject his message of salvation. And that's not just an isolated incident, because we could also look in Matthew 25, 31 through 46, in the parable of the sheep and the goats. And this parable points to the final judgment where Jesus will separate those who are the true followers 
from those who, again, have rejected Jesus. And this is a difficult reality. For in this section of Zechariah and in the teaching in these parables, we have to come to a very sobering and difficult reality to wrestle with, and that is God's sovereignty. That is God's God-given right in making the choices that he makes. But I think the tendency is to look at a passage like this where we see mention of division and we look at it and we somehow question the fairness of God. Like if he is such a good God and he is so loving as he says he is, why would he divide one group to everlasting life and love and why would another be divided to destruction? But I think the real mystery here is why he even saves some. If we really got what we deserved, none of us would be sitting here this morning. You see, this story should have ended a long time ago in the garden. But here we are sitting here 2,000 years later as the church who has conquered sin, death, hell, and the grave, still proclaiming the same message of redemption found in Christ. That is an evidence in and of itself. And just as God draws in this passage the dividing line between the two-third and one-third, any time the message of the gospel is presented, there is a division that takes place. On the one side, there will be those who hear the message, who we see described in Acts 2 when Peter stands up at Pentecost and tells the good news of Christ, what Christ has done. And we are told that upon hearing that message, they are cut to their heart and accept the message as good news and truth. And on the opposite side of that line, there are those who hear the story and they reject it as nothing more than a fairy tale. Or at the very worst, they take it as a personal offense. This morning there are possibly people in this audience who have dismissed this story as just that, a fairy tale. They don't see Jesus as the only means of salvation, eternal security, satisfaction. Because their satisfaction is more rather found in what is tangible, what they can put their hands on, what they can manipulate, what they can find in the experience of their senses that will bring them security. And to that person, I'd say that you are not too far from God's grace. You see, if God can take a man like Saul, who was so vehemently determined to destroy the church, he can also remove your heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh. And to the others of us sitting here who have had our lives transformed by an encounter with Jesus. When we err in the wrong direction, God will not leave us to our devices because his saving is deliberate. Your salvation was a part of his plan. And he will continually intervene. He will continually interrupt your regularly scheduled program with heart alerts. He will point out the places where you need to be delivered from cheap substitutes that won't offer you the satisfaction that only he can provide. And how is it that he's doing this? It's our third provision this morning. He sanctifies us. So thank God it doesn't go like this. He strikes the shepherd, he saves his people, and that's the end of it all. It doesn't stop there. Because for those he saves, they are a continual work in progress. So what happens next? Let's look at verse 9. Verse 9 says this, And I will put this third into the fire and refine them as one refines silver and test them as gold is tested. Well, it seems like a case of going out of the frying pan and into the fryer. The Lord is just 
indicated that he's going to save these people, and now he takes them and puts them directly into the furnace. Why would he put them into the furnace? Well, we get the answer in the image of metal refinement that follows in the second part of the passage. You see, the process of refining precious metals requires multiple steps of melting down the ore and extracting what are known as base metals. You see, base metals are parts of the ore that are not as valuable or just hold no value. In each step, the base metal is removed and what results is a more pure form of the desired metal, the precious metal. So what is God telling the people here and what is he telling us this morning? He's saying this, I'm going to save you, but I'm also going to change you. I'm not just going to let you come and stay as you are. I'm not going to let you continue to serve idols you've always been prone to serving, but I'm going to burn away those parts of your life. And when this happens, this purification, what ends up happening? What is the pure substance that is left remaining? It's a more devoted heart. So then practically speaking, what does the process of refining look like in our lives? How do we see evidence of sanctification? How do we actually even know that it's happening? I think our answer to that is in 1 Peter 4, 12 through 13. And that says this, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. The sanctification process is a series of trials that we face over the duration of our life. You see, trials are part of the process. Trials that you face are evidence of that sanctification. And they're evidence of your salvation. Your heart is changed by Jesus. That change just doesn't happen when you first receive salvation. It is a series of trials that you face over the course of your Christian life. Where continually the Lord is stepping in, taking his finger, pointing it into areas of your life, and through his holiness burning those areas away. So then I guess in knowing this, the next question is, when trials come, how do you view them? When trials come, do they cause you to doubt the Lord's love for you? If you've been saved, he's not done dealing with you. He doesn't just bring you into his house, but cleans you up. And while positionally, through Christ's blood, the accepting of what Christ has done in dying for our sins, we are made right with God. He is continually purifying us until ultimately we stand before him in glory, sinless. So while your trials may lead you to doubt, they are in reality the Lord refining you. Perhaps the response here in view is then to pray and ask the Lord what it is that he's seeking to reveal and deal with in you. Let's circle back to our metallurgy image in verse 9. You see, the gold doesn't just come to purity in one smelting. After many refinements, it reaches a higher carat. A higher carat for a precious metal means that it is more pure and that it is more valuable. And refining is a series of processes. And just like all processes, it requires waiting. 
a series of steps have to happen to reach the end result. It's a fitting analogy because the desire often when we face trials, when we go through the process of being sanctified, is we don't want to sit in the flames. We don't want to wait to have the filth burned away. But that's what's in mind here, this waiting. You see, when the metal is as pure as it can be, when it's reached the end of its refining process, the blacksmith goes over to the cauldron. He leans into that cauldron. And what he sees is his own face. Growing to look like Jesus is more of a process. He strips away the dross from our hearts to make our hearts mere images of him. There's a, a quote from J.I. Packer I, I found in preparation for the sermon that I want to put on the screen in regards to waiting. And it says this, it says, wait on the Lord is a constant refrain in the Psalms. And it is a necessary word for God often keeps us waiting. He is not in such a hurry as we are and it is not his way to give more light on the future than we need for action in the present. Or to guide us more than one step at a time. When in doubt, do nothing, but continue to wait on God. When action is needed, light will come. Not an easy word for people who live in a culture where we like quick results. But the reality is that just as we can't save ourselves, we can't sanctify ourselves. We have to wait for God to do the work, and that takes time. But let me offer you an encouragement in all of this. You don't walk alone. The Lord uses fellow believers in the context of the church to build up, to refine, to test. This is the reason you see us get up here every single week and talk about meaningful membership until we are absolutely blue in the face. When we see reference to the shepherd and the sheep, we see that there is a leader, there are sheep who are part of a flock, and those of the flock know each other. You have that benefit here. There are people here who the Lord wants to use to bring about refinement and sanctification in your life. Now, perhaps there are people sitting here this morning and they've been coming to this church for years. And I use that word loosely. When I speak of church, I speak of the body. They've been coming to this building for years. And they've not taken that next step. My question to you is why? Why? Christianity is not a solo sport. And I think when we analyze this a little bit more, what we'll probably find is that there's a fear of what the Lord might reveal by way of deeper relationships. For those in here that are married, is marriage easy? Raise your hand if your marriage is easy. Maybe it is for this season. Okay, Jason's got it. He's mastered it. Good, it's good. Relationships are hard. Relationships require work. Relationships show us how selfish we are. And they expose the areas of our life that would just be easier, quite frankly, to keep to ourselves. But the church has never been a place for lone wolves. We never see us described as wolves. When you see wolves described, it's in a negative context. Newsflash. We are the sheep of his pasture. Sheep have strength together and protection comes through the shepherd. Yes, ultimately through the good shepherd, but also who pa with pastors and shepherds who love you and desire to invest in your life and see you look more like Jesus.
But in looking at these passages, we don't achieve this sanctification without God first. This doesn't come without a heart change, and that's what we see in verse 9. For in verse 9, we see the Lord saying, They will call upon my name, and I will answer them. I will say they are my people, and they will say, The Lord is my God. Who is the cause of the calling? Well, they didn't just all of a sudden wake up one day and decide that they would now call on the name of the Lord. It's a good day for that. If we were actually waiting for this, we'd be waiting for all of eternity. But rather, the Lord has led them by his power to call out his name. And when they call, he is quick to answer. He identifies them as his people, and they respond that he is their God. You see, the Lord here in doing this works out a love for them that they could not work out themselves. But this love was not free. This love required a great sacrifice. I open with the question, where do you find your security and satisfaction? And I said we need to turn to the good shepherd who satisfies and secures. Who is the good shepherd? Bruce just read it in his assurance of pardon. Christ is the good shepherd. Jesus is the good shepherd. In verse 7, the good shepherd is the one who stands next to the Father. The good shepherd is the only one who could stand next to him as his equal and the only one who could take upon himself his wrath. The good shepherd takes the death stroke of the sword upon himself, experiencing the calamity, the anguish, the pain, the destitution that we deserve so that we receive the mercy the kindness, the joy, the peace, security we should never have. So the good shepherd takes the punishment of the bad shepherd so by the righteous covering of his blood we may come into the security of his pasture. You see, Jesus references this exact text in Matthew 26, 31 through 22. We put that on the screen. It says, and Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But praise God, the sheep did not stay scattered. In the back part of 32, Jesus says, but after I am raised up, I will go before you. This is not the end of the story. When he says, I will go before you, it means that he will rise, that he will take his rightful place as head of the flock, and that even though he is crushed, as we see in Isaiah 53, 5 through 6, which says, he, Jesus, was pierced for our transgression. He, Jesus, was crushed for our iniquities. He didn't stay crushed. He raised on the third day, and by his death, conquered death. If this did not happen, we would not have security. If this did not happen, we would never know satisfaction. If the band would come up. See, most things that are crushed are never suitable for use again. When you take something living into your hand and you close your fingers around it, what happens to the thing that was living? It's dead. But Christ was crushed on the cross. And he was raised. And from the spilling of his blood, the seed of the gospel sprouts from the ground. Those seeds continue to go forth out into the world today. They continue to produce fruit.
And in that life that was crushed on the cross, the life that was raised in Christ, we have everlasting peace. He offers us a sure foundation. He was struck so that we would be made secure. He was crushed so we might be saved. And he experienced God's fiery wrath so that we might be made holy. So two questions for you as we leave here this morning. Are you satisfied in Christ? Is it Christ alone or Christ plus money? Is it Christ alone or Christ plus image? Is it Christ alone or Christ plus health? Christ plus success? Christ plus family? Christ plus anything? Christ plus anything is subtraction. And are you living as though your security is in Christ? Do you value of utmost importance what your security cost him? We're now going to move into a time of prayer. And after I pray, Pastor Bruce is going to come up and we're going to enter into a, uh, a time of communion. As you sit here this morning, before we partake of the elements, Perhaps take a moment to reflect on are there areas where you are not satisfied in Christ? Are there areas where things have been substituted or have crept in? And furthermore, reflect on what are the things that we hold so tight that if they were moved would possibly challenge, would possibly lead us to question that security. Lord, we thank you for this word this morning. We thank you for this thread, this redemptive thread that we see in the text. That we see that it was your plan from the start to come and be, to send your son, who would be the sacrifice once and for all, and upon whose blood being poured out, we would be brought into the peace of your pasture. May we find joy in that this morning. May we be refreshed in this truth. Help us to hold fast to this as we go about our weeks. We love you. Amen.